You may have heard, but Russia's navy is currently experiencing some serious problems. But what you may not have heard is how serious those problems really are. Most people are familiar with what have become classic stories of asymmetric warfare during the war in Ukraine, with the entire Russian Black Sea fleet being essentially completely defeated by a nation that doesn't even have any military ships. For the past two years, the internet has been ablaze, literally, with videos and imagery of billions of dollars worth of Russian vessels bursting into flames and falling below the ocean waves, or limping to new ports hundreds of kilometers away while still on fire, hit by the likes of anti-ship missiles, naval drones, or even simple speedboats. And this carnage has not been small in scale. Russia has currently lost nearly one-third of the ships in their Black Sea fleet, equal to nearly 40% of the fleet's naval tonnage, all ships that have been sunk or severely damaged. And many of the remaining Russian ships in the Black Sea have been forced in response to make one of the most embarrassing journeys in naval history, fleeing from Russia's main Black Sea naval port in Sevastopol to shelter further away from the Ukrainian coastline, all to avoid being blown up by something that costs over 10,000 times less than the ship it destroys. It's gotten so bad that even the British Defense Minister has gone on record to say that Russia's Black Sea Fleet has been rendered functionally inactive. And many people are wondering if we're seeing the end of modern naval warfare as we know it, and the start of a new era defined by asymmetric methods, or if Russia's navy is really just that bad. The situation is especially embarrassing for Russia because the preservation of the naval port in Sevastopol on Crimea has been argued by many to have been one of Vladimir Putin's main military objectives behind the invasion of Ukraine. But now it's clear to everyone that even if Russia manages to win the war and keep Crimea, the Sevastopol naval base has largely been proven to be indefensible and irrelevant, something that Russia themselves seems to have reluctantly acknowledged as well, as they are thought to be trying to build a new naval port in Abkhazia to house all the ships that can no longer be permanently based in Sevastopol. It's the equivalent of if the U.S. Navy had to move their Pacific Fleet from San Diego hundreds of miles up the coast to a less ideal geographic position in Monterey or San Francisco because Mexico had managed to make the San Diego Fleet functionally inoperational. That would be embarrassing, to say the least, and frankly, unimaginable. But for Russia, something close to that scenario has now happened. Large naval fleets are supposed to exist to help a nation exert global power and influence, not prove to the world that you no longer have that capability. Traditionally, one rule of strong modern navies has been that they have been used to support ground campaigns and air campaigns by giving the ability to strike targets from a distance, from a ship far off in the ocean that the enemy cannot effectively fire back upon. This creates psychological pressure on enemy troops, and usually, eventually forces enemies to surrender or relocate, and gives the nation with the modern navy a strategic edge that their opponents cannot overcome on the ground. But that's the opposite of what we're seeing in the Black Sea with Russia, where their supposedly modern navy is the one having to relocate instead of Ukrainian troops, as Russian ships find themselves being continually struck by ground-based attack systems that they can't seem to do anything about. And when the navy is trying to hide from the ground troops instead of the other way around, you know it's a big shift. A big factor playing into Ukraine's defeat of Russia's navy has been cyber warfare, with Ukraine able to hack into sensitive Russian military databases to unlock information that reveals the weak points of Russia's military infrastructure. This has included encryption keys to help them listen in on where ships are being positioned, and engineering plans revealing the best spots to strike those ships. But on the flip side, Russian hackers have also targeted Ukraine hitting everything from the power grid to Ukraine's telecommunication systems, and even the devices and accounts of private citizens in attempts to collect intel. This type of cyber warfare is quickly becoming one of the primary battlegrounds of the future, and will only become more important over time. A fact that brings me briefly, if I may, to the sponsor of this episode that made this research, animation, and editing possible. I don't own any Russian battleships, but to help protect myself and what I do own against bad actors and cyber attacks of all shapes and sizes, I've been using Surfshark. It's not a one-stop solution that instantly solves all of my internet security problems, but it does provide me with several needed layers of protection that keep me safe when I make the kinds of small mistakes that could lead to my information being compromised, something everyone should probably be thinking about these days. First, Surfshark VPN acts as a middleman to receive my internet traffic and encrypt it to keep me anonymous. Then, to help protect my device itself, Surfshark Antivirus helps me scan links and files for viruses before I download them from the internet or open them. 
so that simple emails with pictures or PDFs don't end up compromising my sensitive information. Finally, Surfshark Alert lets me know if my data has ever been compromised, giving me peace of mind on most days and letting me know when I need to take immediate action on others if I wake up to that dreaded information leak email. It's a very simple and quite inexpensive way to strengthen your security, only costing around $3 a month. And if you use my coupon code ICARUS, you can even get an extra 4 months when you sign up. So check out Surfshark today using the link in the description of this video so that your internet security does not end up in a situation where it has more holes than a Russian battleship. And speaking of holes in Russian battleships, on April 8, 2024, this Russian military ship found itself on fire with a unique twist. It wasn't anywhere near Ukraine. The Serpukov, a Russian missile corvette, was stationed in the Baltic Sea far out of range from Ukrainian territory, and yet still managed to find itself disabled by intentional sabotage from Ukrainian forces, who started a fire that completely destroyed the ship's means of communications and automation, along with the morale of the Russian soldiers stationed in the Baltic, who thought they were out of range of the conflict. The situation was devastatingly embarrassing for Russia, showing that their navy was vulnerable to simple infiltration in their own home territory during a time of active war when their fleet was supposed to be on high alert. And most importantly, it demonstrated that the degradation of the Russian Navy as a fighting force went far beyond the Black Sea. This was especially bad for Russia because the Black Sea Fleet and the Baltic Fleet have long been considered by many people to be Russia's most strategically important fleets. That's because they protect Russia's primary population centers from the bodies of water that are most vulnerable to what Russia perceives as their biggest geopolitical opponents. Meanwhile, Russia's other two fleets, the fleet in the Arctic Ocean stationed in Murmansk, which goes down into the Atlantic as well, and the fleet in the Pacific Ocean stationed in Vladivostok, are more about nuclear deterrence, focused around operating submarine fleets and defending against enemy submarine activities, only playing a minor role in terms of other traditional naval capabilities. Russia might have massive coastlines meeting with the Arctic and the Pacific, but not a lot of Russians live near those coastlines or even within range of those coastlines. While on the flip side, Russia has millions of inhabitants and important infrastructure right on the coasts of the Black Sea and the Baltic. So if Russia had to pick between its fleets, it is most likely that Russia would choose to keep its Black Sea fleet and its Baltic fleet strong and capable, because those are the most important for actual national defense. But the problem is that being forced to make this choice would put Russia in a progressively weakened geopolitical position against the United States and China, as the deficiencies in their other fleets became more apparent, a gap that would only widen over time. This process has now started in earnest. Considering that Russia's Black Sea fleet has now been proven to be irrelevant directly by its performance on the battlefield, and that the Baltic fleet has been proven to be irrelevant indirectly by association, since it is largely made up of the same classes of ships as those Ukraine has decimated in the Black Sea, we see a massive problem for Russia. Simply stated, if Russia can't manage to effectively defend a paltry few hundred kilometers of coastline in these critically important theaters, how could they ever hope to hold dominance over the nearly 37,000 kilometers of coastline bordering the Arctic and the Pacific, and into the territory beyond? Or perhaps more importantly, how could they convince other competitor nations that they were still a relevant force in these remote waters? This gives us a sense of the scale of the problem that Russia is now facing as they try to convince the world that they should still be afraid of the Russian navy and of Russian power in general, while the onlooking world looks out and sees something only slightly more scary than a rubber ducky. And this situation will only get worse over time when one considers how much investment Russia will need to make to replace its flagship fleet in the Black Sea and to prove its navy's functional capabilities to overcome the weaknesses that Ukraine is currently exploiting. You see, naval power is unique compared to all other types of power, in the sense that no matter how much money and no matter how many resources you have, there is always a hard limit to which you can invest in improving and growing your navy. Naval ships take an inordinate amount of time and expertise to complete, and working on a ship is not a process that can be done quickly, no matter how many resources you have, because different steps have to be completed before other steps can be started. 
And not only that, there are only so many dry docks where naval work can take place because of the physical limitations of a naval ship. Namely, naval ships need to go in ports of a certain depth, and they are too big and large to be transported efficiently over land. Russia only has so many of these ports capable of building and storing naval ships, and even fewer in ice-free warm water areas where they can operate year-round. This has always been a problem for the growth and expansion of their empire, and somehow they've now managed to make it even worse than ever. Their lack of warm water, deep water naval ports is one of the reasons they were so desperate to hold on to Sevastopol. But now, as we already noted, with regular Ukrainian strikes able to easily hit the area, that part is now basically out of the picture for them as well, unless they want to keep wasting money building billion-dollar naval vessels that can then be promptly sunk by a Ukrainian naval drone that costs a million dollars or less. What that means is that even if they had unlimited money and resources, and even if they started today, it would be a long time before Russia's navy could reach the level of functional capacity that they had just two years ago, let alone prepare for the future. And when you consider all of this with the fact that Russia does not have unlimited money or unlimited resources, and the fact that their naval power is not the only thing they will need to work to rebuild and upgrade, it starts to look very bad. The rest of the world is currently working to modernize their navies at a rapid pace, and most competitive countries are rapidly upgrading or replacing their fleets as new groundbreaking technology is introduced. But while this is going on, the Russian navy will have to struggle just to tread water and stay above the waves. Not only is Russia limited by dry docks, but there are many categories of advanced equipment that Russia simply no longer has access to. Historically, Russia has gotten a lot of the major technological components used in their nuclear submarines and their navy in general from nations like the United States and the UK. Obviously, moving forward, these nations are not going to be exactly forthcoming with future supply shipments, and other potential suppliers, like China or North Korea, either manufacture for different incompatible platforms or haven't yet reached a sufficient level of technological prowess to replace these Western parts. If they had, Russia would probably already have been buying from them. And that means that Russia not only has to repair their fleet and try on their own to create the innovative capabilities that will shape the world of tomorrow, but they also need to find new ways to reinvent the technology of yesterday that they never learned how to manufacture for themselves in the first place. This is something they've already started doing, so far, with horrendous results, requiring complete redesigns of major systems that, in a best-case scenario, aren't expected to be completed until 2028. And that's assuming everything works properly the first time around, and that Ukraine won't be able to strike these industries as soon as they begin making progress. This isn't limited to just high-tech parts, either. It also applies to basic spare parts, which the Russian Navy is now running out of, ironically due to their dependence in particular on the Ukrainian shipbuilding industry. Didn't really think that one through before your invasion, now did you guys? Side note, that also sort of helps critical onlookers see right through Russian propaganda about Ukraine being aggressive towards them, since aggressive nations don't generally provide critical components to the navies of enemy nations that they plan to invade in the near future. The same can be said of the US, the UK, and many other NATO countries. But I digress. In one recent example, a Russian ship caught fire in the Barents Sea near the border with Norway due to a lack of proper parts that led to a malfunction in its engine room. Apparently, Russian knockoffs being produced in a country known for rampant corruption just don't do a good enough job of replacing the Ukrainian originals. Who would have thought? It's okay, though. The ship was only completely full of explosives, like torpedoes and artillery shells. Not a dangerous situation at all. Then again, Maybe this was just an innovative Russian science experiment, where they were trying to help the ice in the region melt faster, so that they could get to the frozen oil resources down below and make up for some of their lost profits from not being able to capture Ukraine's oil fields in three days as planned. In another example, Russia sent a submarine to Cuba in an apparent show of force, only to be embarrassed when the sub surfaced and revealed missing panels, which likely fell off in transit due to improper maintenance or lack of appropriate equipment, and made the supposedly sneaky sub extremely easy to spot on radar. Then again, maybe that's just Russia's new strategy, hide in plain sight and pretend like you're a dolphin.
All that being said, the point is, with these basic resources being bogged down while repairing and upgrading the fleets in the Black Sea and the Baltic during what is probably the most significant period of technological advancement in recent history, Russia is almost certain to fall even further behind in critical capabilities in its other major fleets due to a lack of investment. And yet, that's just the beginning of Russia's naval woes, which go far beyond the mere degradation of their fleets to the changing strategic nature of the global naval chessboard, in a direction that is very much not favorable for any Russian hopes of future imperial expansion. As one example, let's briefly consider the Baltic. Traditionally, the Baltic fleet has been one of Russia's most capable fleets tooled for offensive missions, things like mass amphibious landings or aggressive naval blockades. And for a long time, at least up until Russia's naval capabilities were proven to be so weak by the war in Ukraine, this fleet has been taken very seriously by NATO, who believed Russia might try to use the fleet one day to recapture the Baltic states of Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. In the Baltic, Russia has two main naval ports, one in the city of St. Petersburg and the other in the Russian exclave of Kaliningrad, which borders Poland and Lithuania. And for many years, it has been widely believed that Russia had drawn up plans to use these two naval ports as pincers to blockade the Baltic states within mere hours. According to the plan, Russian forces would travel up from Kaliningrad to invade Sweden's largely demilitarized Gotland Island and form half of a blockade, while forces from St. Petersburg would head out to complete the blockade and potentially perform amphibious landings on the Baltic states as well. The idea was that this would completely block the Baltic states from food, resupplies, and military support, and force NATO into extreme negotiations to avoid a humanitarian crisis. No small task, to be certain. However, this Russian strategy was dependent on a few factors that Russia can no longer count on, not least of which is their own proven lackluster military performance. First was the idea that Russia could convince Finland and Sweden to stay neutral in a theoretical naval conflict in the Baltic, which seemed a reasonable assumption for a long time due to both nations' very publicly stated desires for neutrality. And second was the idea that Sweden was either weak or apathetic as a nation, and would only react to Russia's occupation of their sparsely populated Gotland Island with an extremely measured response. I've made an entire 30-minute episode proving why this is absolutely not true. But to be fair, Russia was emboldened to make these types of assumptions when they captured Crimea from Ukraine without a fight or international response in 2014. But when Russia conducted its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, it was forced to rethink both points, as both Finland and Sweden promptly applied to join NATO in response, upheaving the strategic value of the entire Russian Baltic fleet. This move meant that NATO forces now had a guaranteed right to move from both Finland and Sweden to counter any Russian aggression in the Baltic states from the air, making naval blockades inconvenient, but not the end of the world. And it also meant that Russia could not invade Gotland Island without triggering a global response. Because of these factors, Russia's Baltic fleet is now essentially totally irrelevant. Not just because of its inferior capability, but because there are simply no meaningful missions left for the fleet to conduct in the Baltic. And the fleet can't be confident that they can leave the Baltic to redeploy to other theaters either, since to leave the Baltic Sea, Russia would have to go through a very narrow choke point between Sweden and Denmark, which would put it well within range of not only naval vessels, but also the kinds of asymmetric methods that Ukraine used to destroy the Black Sea Fleet. So now the Baltic fleet is forced to just sit in port and wait for things like Ukrainian forces infiltrating it and lighting it on fire to further prove its irrelevance. On the other side of the world, the geopolitical situation is also changing for Russia as China becomes increasingly aggressive around the port of Vladivostok, something I've made other videos about. In the short term, this will almost certainly amount to nothing meaningful. But in the long term, this will create a situation where Russia has to retool their Pacific fleet. It will now need to be not just a nuclear deterrent to the United States on the other side of the globe, but also a strong fleet capable of answering against potential future conventional Chinese aggression in the fleet's own neighborhood. Not something that Russia has traditionally worried very much about, but which seems almost sure to become a very expensive problem that could stretch Russia's thin naval budget beyond the breaking point. In 2009, Dmitry Medvedev, Russia's former president and a man widely seen as Putin's socking puppet, made a foreboding statement about the fragility of Russia's international situation when he said that without a navy, Russia does not have a future. He probably wasn't wrong. 
Navies are so vitally important that, while any country that doesn't have a navy might still be able to exert regional power, their significance as a global force will be slim to none. And Russia, of course, is intimately familiar with this fact, more so than most other nations. At several points in their history, Russia has lost their naval fleet just prior to major events that eroded Russian power and led to major changes in the stability of the country, giving a hint to potential futures if Russia can't manage to turn its naval situation around today. In what is probably currently giving Kremlin leadership painful flashbacks, a large reason that the United States owns Alaska is due to the failures of the Russian Navy in the Black Sea during the Crimean War. Talk about deja vu something which spiraled into a much broader geopolitical crisis for Russia by wasting their national budget and causing them to realize they could no longer resist the British in the Alaskan territory. In response, Russia conducted a desperate fire sale of Alaska to the U.S. to try to at least salvage something out of the whole ordeal before the British took the land from them wholesale. Later, a large reason for the fall of the Russian Empire had to do with the Japanese crushing the Russian Navy in the Pacific during the Russo-Japanese War and what is widely seen as one of the greatest naval defeats in all of human history. This embarrassing defeat helped lead to the Russian Revolution of 1905 that weakened imperial powers, which then fell apart completely in the Bolshevik Revolution not long afterwards, when a beleaguered Russian state found themselves unable to perform as expected in World War I. Having their navy around in World War I, rather than having it be sunk by the Japanese ten years earlier, probably would have helped Russia fare a bit better. Maybe they'd even still have their empire today. Who knows? But then again, they don't call Russia's last emperor, Tsar Nikolaus, for nothing. And unfortunately for the Russians, after the Russian Empire fell and then its successor fell with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they failed to learn their lesson and elected a new national leader with many of the same characteristics as Russia's ill-fated last Tsar. They chose Vladimir Putin, and as such, this wouldn't be the last time that Russia got Putin in their place from a naval perspective due to overconfidence that wasn't based in objective, tactical reality. Since Vladimir Putin portrays himself as one of the greatest students of Russian history, this all must make him very nervous as he considers the lessons of Russia's past and what the present situation might mean for his own future. We'll see what happens. For more modern geopolitical analysis from the Icarus Project, be sure to subscribe to my second channel where I publish several additional videos every week in a more informal and casual environment. And check out these other videos from the Icarus Project to dive deeper into some of the topics that were briefly mentioned in this episode. Don't forget to check out Surfshark to secure your internet browsing.